What causes diabetes? Diabetes is one of the most confusing health topics on the internet. Might actually be number one. And few questions are more hotly debated and misunderstood than what causes type 2 diabetes. I wanted to make a video to dispel some of that confusion, so I'm very excited to say we got one of the world's leading diabetologists to talk to us and shed some light on this issue. Professor Roy Taylor has been studying type 2 diabetes for almost 40 years. He's a professor of medicine and metabolism at Newcastle University in the UK. He has authored numerous studies and books on diabetes, and he spearheaded the groundbreaking DIRECT trial, which showed type 2 diabetes can be reversed. We started from the very beginning. What causes diabetes? The definition of diabetes is an elevated glycemia, so there's an idea then that it must have been too many carbs were eaten for, for glucose to be uh, elevated for, their, for the person to be hyperglycemic. And I have people messaging me pa in panic, terrified of eating a piece of fruit or a bowl of oatmeal because it's going to give them diabetes. Yeah. So what does the latest science say? Do we know what causes diabetes? It's when a susceptible person acquires too much fat inside the pancreas. And so these insulin producing cells are struggling for quite a long period of time. That's pre-diabetes. And eventually they start not being able to function properly and that's diabetes. So what's causing type two diabetes? It's carrying around more fat than the individual can cope with. That's a profoundly important thing. Each of us inherits a very different collection of genes, purely by the luck of the draw. And if we say, well, what's relevant to diabetes? We need to understand something that I would call the personal fat threshold. So let's just look at a person who is, say, 300 pounds in weight, and yet doesn't have diabetes. Hang on, what's going on there? Well, his beta cells have got a very high tolerance for fat. They're not phased by the fat being around them. And so that person's threshold to develop diabetes is very high. And then there are some people, 10% of people with type 2 diabetes in the United Kingdom, have a body mass index under 25. 25? They look thin. So what's going on there? Well, our work has shown that it's just the same. It's these people who are very susceptible to a gain in weight. So what's your personal fat threshold? We can't tell, but we can say if someone's developed type two diabetes, they've become heavier than their own body can cope with. Mm -hmm. In the consultation, a doctor has one person sitting in front of them and the advice ought to be directed at that person. So we need to personalize it and understand we've got a crashingly simple disease happening in complicated individuals. So it could be that those people who are accumulating the same amount of fat, but for, for, for some reason it's less damaging, they are more resistant to fat being present inside the pancreas and inside the liver, or it could be that there is less fat altogether in those organs. Do you have you guys teased out? Yes. That's, that's absolutely the case. Now, uh, people with type 2 diabetes do have considerably more fat in the organs mm -hmm. than people of the same weight who don't have type 2 diabetes. Mm -hmm. So there is a matter of quantity, but I think it's quite likely that also there will be a susceptibility at the level of the cell. Mm -hmm. So given the same amount of fat, one person may just be struggling with their beta cells, another might be just fine. So we all accumulate fat subcutaneously under the skin, especially around the waist and in the hips. It's our love handles, right? But those subcutaneous stores have a limit. And when they're full, the body starts storing that excess fat around the organs in our abdominal cavity and eventually inside those organs. And that's when the mayhem starts. Some of us can store more fat under the skin and can already be pretty overweight and still not have metabolic issues, while others have limited storage capacity in that subcutaneous compartment and start putting away the extra fat inside the organs and having metabolic issues while still being in the normal BMI range, while still looking relatively lean. That's this key idea of the personal fat threshold. 
There's also ethnical variation. For example, Asian populations generally have a lower threshold, so they start having metabolic issues and a lower BMI. So the idea is that despite this person-to-person -person variation on the exact threshold, the root cause is the same for everybody. Excess energy being taken in chronically and too much fat being stored for that individual's capacity. So the next obvious question is, are some foods worse than others? Do some foods precipitate this process and some protect us? That's what we turn to next. To summarize the, this idea of the cause of diabetes, it would then be an accumulation of too much fat for the individual threshold of the individual, which could come about, correct me if I'm wrong, by overeating calories of any source. Too many, too many carbs, too, many, too much fat, too much protein, whatever, whatever it happens to be. The body will handle whatever fuel is thrown at it. So if we look at human beings across the world, the diets are very different in different parts of the world, and yet people can become overweight in any part. The body can turn the carbohydrates into sugar, as we've already mentioned. Uh, that happens with digestion, but also one into fat. And the body can use fat to burn it, in fact, in a form that's similar to, to sugars, mm -hmm. but it can also take protein and just turn it straight into carbohydrate or sugar. And so it doesn't matter directly how much carbohydrate a person eats, except highly processed foods are likely to contain quite a lot of carbohydrate. Added sugar, because the manufacturers add it to improve the taste, to get people to buy more. And also they formulate it in a way that you want to eat more and more. So there is a problem with processed foods and very high carbohydrate foods, certainly sugary foods. So if we were to set those aside for a moment and say, does it matter if you're eating, uh, say, potatoes or fruit, which contain carbohydrate, compared with other non-starchy vegetables? And the answer is not a lot. But if people are eating the processed foods or very sugary foods, they tend to take in more energy, more food than they would do with this nice, healthy cooking from raw, as it were. So the type of food does matter, but really only in the matter of how much food the body takes in. You can develop diabetes if you ate steak alone, if you ate enough of it. And so if people like eating a low carb diet, that's a perfectly good way of uh, losing weight or keeping the weight under control. Some people like it, some people hate it. Again, what a surprise, we're all individuals. Yeah. So it's no one size for, for, that suits all. If we look at all the studies that have dealt with this very emotional subject of a low carbohydrate diet, we find that when we put them all together and look at the ones that we can be certain are really solid, there's precious little difference between low carb approach and a low fat approach. So it's worthwhile just sitting back and reflecting on the simplicity of how we can survive as a species, what foods we actually need, and how our incredible bodies will turn one food stuff into another to be able to cope. Again, it's a matter of eating what you like, but not too much of it. So this idea of wiggle room that we've touched on so many times in the past, there are some fundamental principles of healthy eating, but under that umbrella, there's room for personal variation. Along the same lines, there are several valid strategies to maintain a healthy body weight. And we've looked at this topic in some detail before. Next time, we'll keep looking at our conversation with Professor Taylor and the exact approach step-by-step -step, they used in their trials to reverse diabetes. Let me know your thoughts. Catch you next time.